So um, I want to thank everyone for coming out and uh, try not to bump into each other out there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Brian Snowdy, and I'm going to be your guest lecturer today. And of course, our subject is the Kennedy assassination. Um, about a year or so ago, I put together a presentation on the assassination that I called the cast of characters. And I went through about, oh, maybe about two dozen people who were in Dallas that day or were associated with people in Dallas that day, their interpersonal relationships, nefarious activities, and more often than not, their untimely demise. And I also believe I provided enough evidence to show that not only was Lee Harvey Oswald not guilty of this particular crime, that he was framed for the murder. And I did this presentation a few different times, a few different places, and at the end of every single one of them, I always had at least one person who would come up to me and say, hey, Brian, if Oswald didn't kill President Kennedy, who did? And my answer was always the same, I don't know meaning I don't know the exact person who pulled the trigger that fired the bullet that blew the back of Kennedy's head out. I have some ideas. I've narrowed it down to a few names, but I really don't know exactly who. But I do know there were multiple killers in multiple locations in Daly Plaza that day. It was a kill zone, and Kennedy wasn't getting out of there alive. So I decided to do another presentation that I call the killers. Who were the assassins? Who were the boots on the ground, so to speak? We're going to go through that. Every once in a while, one of my coworkers will come up to me, and uh, or an acquaintance of mine who knows I'm into this Kennedy stuff, and they'll say, uh, and they'll have just watched one, what I call one of these Oswald did it shows, and this is the season when they all come out, and they roll these things out. They make new ones every year. All this propaganda. And uh, usually it starts off the latest computer evidence that shows that Lee Harvey Oswald was the lone gunman. Blah 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 blah. And they'll have watched one of these shows, and they'll come up to me, and they'll say, well, you know, Brian, I just watched this show, and I'm, I'm pretty convinced that Oswald did it. What do you think? You know, obviously, they've seen a show on it, so they're an expert. And uh, this is pretty fun. You can try this at home. I often retort something to this effect. Um, well, you know, real killers use real bullets, and real bullets do real damage. So why don't we count the bullets, count the damage? And around that time, their face starts to change color. That's the fun part. I thought we could do that today to establish multiple shooters. We got one bullet that misses the car completely, hits a curb, and a piece of that curb or a piece of that bullet nicks a bystander in the face, a guy named James Tegg. We got a bullet, that we got Kennedy's hit in the throat, he's hit in the back, and he's hit in the head by at least one shot, possibly multiple shots simultaneously. That's already a minimum of four, which is one past the official story. We got a through and through bullet hole through the windshield of the car. We got one that hits the chrome strip on the car. We got bullet damage on the Stemmons freeway sign. We got a bullet that's found in the grass. Everybody forgets that bullet. All heard of the magic bullet? This is the lost bullet. Connolly's not even hit yet. What's that, eight shots? He's hitting the, uh, uh, the, the shoulder, the back shoulder. He's hitting the wrist, and he's hitting the leg. That's 11 shots. Now, usually by this time, they kind of slink off. They don't want to confront me. But every once in a while, they'll get a little indignant. Well, you know, Brian, bullets can do multiple damages. Sure. Let's say the one that comes through the windshield is the one that hit Kennedy in the throat. That's still 10. Let's say the one that hits Connolly in the leg is the one that went through his wrist. That's still 9, and they're coming from different directions. And that's when cognitive dissonance is going to hit these people in the face like a bus running over an ice cream cone. They're going to look at you like guppies at feeding time. And they're either just going to slink away or they're going to quickly change the subject to who's banging who in Hollywood and when the heck is that next Star Wars movie coming out. You know, really important stuff like that. So, OK, you can tell I'm getting a little tuned up now. <laughs> so, <laughs> so let's go ahead and get in the middle of this thing. And I'd like you to save all your questions and commentary until the end. Um, I can get distracted really, really easily, and I don't want to be here until next Christmas. No. <laughs> you, you can bust me on it. Now, I base this, I base this um, presentation on a conversation that took place in a uh, Fort Worth hotel room uh, days after the assassination between Malcolm Wallace, who was Lyndon Johnson's personal hitman, and a then-mafia associate, a guy named Rod McKenzie. It's also based off of... Uh, photographs taken in Daly Plaza, and countless hours of research done by other Kennedy buffs out there. So that's what I'm basing this on today. 
So who on earth is this Rod McKenzie character, and why is he important to our story? Look at that handsome fella. He's still out there running around chasing girls. So you ladies, if you see him coming, I warned you. Okay? I'm not even kidding. Uh, Rod McKenzie was born in 1934, grew up in the state of Massachusetts. He lived in Lowell. He lived in Dracut, Jamaica Plains in Boston during World War II. And um, in the summertime, he'd go to New Hampshire where he visited his uncle, John T. Benson, who ran an outfit called Benson's Wild Animal Farm. And there he learned a lot about animals. He met some very famous animal trainers at the time, uh, Joe R. Karras and Mabel Stark. Um, and uh, they had like a little traveling petting zoo that would go around the greater New England area. And on this petting zoo, they had some carnival games. And as a kid, he learned how to work some of these games. He met some carnival people, circus people there too. Now, being a rather energetic young lad, he got into trouble every once in a while in a high school Halloween prank gone wrong he accidentally lit his school on fire. And this one got him sent before a judge. And the judge basically said, look here, kid, you're going into the National Guard, and at age 17, you're going into the US Army, which he did. After his training in the Army, he sent right into the Korean War and right into combat. And, and I mean combat, hand-to-hand -hand fighting. And at the end of his time in the Army, he'd won himself a bronze and a silver star. When he gets back home, home life wasn't looking too good. He didn't get along with his parents, wasn't going to be moving in with them. His Uncle Benson had passed away some years before, and the animal farm was starting to slip a little. So he decides to go back in to the Army. Not to re-enlist, but to extend for a year. But he wants medical training. So he spends some time at Fort Sam Houston getting some medical training, and then he's sent into Indochina. We call that Vietnam today. And by the way, the United States government's been screwing around in, in Vietnam since the late 1940s. A lot of people don't realize that, possibly before that even. His last few months uh, in the Army were spent at Letterman Army Hospital, where he uh, learns how to scrub surgery. He becomes a surgical nurse. When he gets out of the Army there in San Francisco at the Presidio, he becomes a regular at a bar called the El Rancho, where he hooks up with a character named William Alexander Morgan. Look him up on the internet. Very colorful. Uh, Morgan always had plenty of money and wasn't too shy in sharing it. One day admits to McKenzie he's doing burglaries on behest of the local mafia, and he really needs a partner. McKenzie agrees and gets onto this burglary and steal and safes business like a vulture to roadkill. That's yep. quote. <laughs> yes. And the two of them are ripping places off all over the greater um, Bay Area there. Now, when the heat gets too heavy for the boys, they move to Los Angeles, where McKenzie is introduced to gangster Johnny Rosselli. Yes. Because I just mentioned that you meet Johnny Rosselli. I mean, no, you mentioned he passed over on the fact that uh, we were doing burglaries around the whole area, but not for who? For a strictly mob people. Yes, it was mob people, yes. And you guys got to keep a little bit of it. A lot. A lot of it. We had first come. Okay. So he goes to Los Angeles where he meets gangster Johnny Rosselli and his buddy Delbert Graham. And they're in the movie business together. They're producing circus movies, amongst other things. Circus movies were very popular in the 1950s at that time. And we're going to see some other activity we're involved in. And uh, not only are the boys stealing safes and robbing places there in uh, Los Angeles, they head out to Las Vegas where they perform more than 40 burglaries there. Now, when the heat gets too heavy for the boys there, they decide we're going to go to Cuba. Morgan has connections there. He goes first. And Morgan decides he's going to become a revolutionary. He has military background himself and soon gains a high level in Castro's army. At the end of the revolution, Castro has Morgan executed. Not a happy ending there. When McKenzie gets there, he becomes a service bartender at the El Presidente Hotel. It's El Presidente, wasn't it? Yes. And in his spare time for an extra buck or two, he starts making phony IDs for people. One day, he's approached by an alphabet agency character. A guy sh shows him a national security uh, NS yeah, yes. Yes. card. Defense Intelligence Defense Industrial Security Command, yes. And uh, says, look here, Batista's guys are on to you with this phony ID nonsense you're doing. But, um, and if you don't listen to me, you're going to end up going to La Cabana, the jail there, and you don't want to go there but we like your phony ID. We're going to send you to Fort Detrick, Maryland. You're going to get a little more training. And then we're going to, you're going to make phony IDs for us. 
giving Mackenzie the carrot he had to eat. After a few weeks at Fort Detrick, Abe says, look, um, we decided we don't need you in Cuba. You have a carnival background, a circus background. What we want to do is we want to put together something called a safe house on the road. And you'll travel around this little carnival outfit, and you're going to hide out people we tell you to hide out, and you're going to make phony IDs for people we tell you to make phony IDs for. Are you going to get paid? Again, Mackenzie doesn't have a choice. He sent into Chicago, where this carnival outfit, codenamed ZR Flat Store, was put together under the watchful eye of none other than acting mafia boss Sam Momo Giancana. And this is where people get screwed up. And I'm going to, if you can't wrap your brain around this next thing I'm going to tell you, the, none of this is going to make any sense. And that's the fact that alphabet agencies have been working together with organized crime for decades, since at least World War II, like this. Okay, and they've been involved in every nefarious kind of activity you could possibly imagine. Money laundering, bank fraud, weapons trafficking, drug dealing, and contract friggin' murder. And it's all done under the guise of, oh, we're protecting the American people from the evils of godless communism. And if you believe that, I have a bridge to sell you. Just, just meet me right after this presentation, and I'm going to sell you a really, I'm going to give you the deal of a century on this bridge. It's from a very famous place called Brooklyn. You might have heard of it. Now, how do we know that the ZR flat store thing ever even existed? That sounds like a pretty tall tale. Well, we do have some documentation on it. Here we have a memorandum here, interagency thing, Defense Intelligence Agency. It mentions the ZR flat store here, mentions McKenzie's name more than once, actually. And look at this, it mentions an outfit called Permindex. That's a Mossad money laundering operation. So we see the sticky, yucky, messy fingerprints of Israel on this. And they're going to pop up once or twice more, too. And look at that. He's going to be hooked up with his old buddies, Johnny Rosselli and Delbert Graham. He's going to be calling in for them on the carnival outfit, getting instructions, who he's going to hide out, things like that. But Johnny Rosselli was the first gangster hired by the CIA to kill Fidel Castro. So he is already eyeballs deep into the spook world. It turns out Delbert Graham is working for DISC, Defense Industrial Security Command along with his movie and, and uh, circus business. <clears throat> so here we have a merger between Hollywood, uh, intelligence agencies, the mob, and uh, the military industrial complex. And a kid that doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> and a kid that doesn't know what he's doing at the time. <laughs> and I got big news for you. This is still going on today. Go online and look up how many of your favorite movies and television shows are produced, concepted, and funded by the CIA. It'll shock the hell out of you. As far as I'm concerned, Hollywood is 5% entertainment and 95% mind control. That's just my opinion. Anyway, for the next few years, Mackenzie's traveling around on this carnival outfit. They're making phony IDs or hiding out all sorts of weird characters. They're getting paid by the mob. They're getting paid by the alphabet agency. And the carnival itself is making money. Yes, and everybody's happy. Now, one night, Mackenzie's having a good time with this cute little Chippewa girl, and he's coming back late. He's driving his truck, falls asleep, and poof, crashes it. And all of his phony ID stuff is laying all over the road right outside Wilcox, Arizona. Desert. Not road. In the desert. Yes, there was a road you were driving on at one yeah, particular time. Okay. Well, the cops pull along, they find this, and Mackenzie goes to the pokey. He gets a call out to Johnny Rosselli, and in a week or so, he's sprung. He's hidden for a time in Mexico, and eventually he's driven into Dallas, Texas, where he's going to meet his new pals and get his new job. First person he meets, Lyndon Johnson's hitman, Malcolm Wallace. He meets police officer J.D. Tippett. He meets a, uh, a gangster who's going to be his new handler, a local guy named Jake Miranda who runs a steakhouse, amongst other businesses. And another gangster you might have heard of, Jack Ruby. Mackenzie's new job is he's going to be running a permanent safe house in Dallas, Texas, right off of Holland Avenue. And Mackenzie drew a map here for us. Here's the safe house area here. It was an old coach house, probably built in the 1800s, that had been converted into a little apartment here. And he's got other places. Here's Fair Park. Here's the uh, Baylor Hospital. And further down the road is the uh, book building and Daly Plaza. Yes, I'm going to mention that. Now, I went, on, I went on Google Maps to see if I could find the safe house. It no longer exists. But it finds out Mackenzie's map is pretty accurate. 
So this is where the safe house would have been. These, all, these buildings are all new here. It's all overdone. These buildings look brand new. They look like they just built them the day before yesterday. But the safe house no longer exists. Uh, Mackenzie did draw us a floor plan of the safe house. And they had a couple little, little cubicle areas here, his, his room. They had a day room with a pool table. They had like a little kitchenette, plenty of booze. And um, here's a bathroom. And upstairs was a little loft. But apparently, uh, there wasn't enough people to stay there. Well, running the safe house turns out to be kind of a nothing job, not much to do. Mackenzie doesn't want to twiddle his thumbs all day. So he goes to Jake Miranda, and he goes to Jack Ruby, and he says, look, I got medical training in the Army. Why don't you get me a job at one of the local hospitals? And in a short time, he's scrubbing surgery up at Baylor Hospital. And it's in the basement lunchroom in Baylor Hospital where Rod McKenzie, Jake Miranda, and Johnny Rosselli all were during the time of the assassination. McKenzie had no idea the president was going to be shot that day. He didn't know the president had been shot until they're in surgery, scrubbed in in the OR, and someone sticks their head in and says, Kennedy's been shot. He had no idea the president was dead until much later he gets off work past 11 o'clock. But he starts putting two and two together and coming up with 25. He knows he's involved. A couple days after the assassination, McKenzie gets off work from the hospital, goes over to Jake Miranda's steakhouse. He's going to get something to eat, have a couple beers, maybe chase a girl or two or three or five. And who's in there drunk and talking loud is Malcolm Wallace. Now, <clears throat> Jake Miranda comes over to McKenzie. He goes, look, you know Wallace. Why don't you get him out of here? He's making a, making a nuisance of himself. Well, according to McKenzie, he needed that like he needed a third testicle. But he did what he was told. He gets Wallace to hop in his pickup truck, which had enough booze in it to take care of the 56th Infantry Division. And they went to Fort Worth, Texas together. They check into a hotel run by a couple of Mexican gals, couldn't speak a word of English. Apparently, Wallace knew who they were. And the boys start partying with the girls. They start having sex with them. And after they're done with the girls, in a drunken haze, Wallace gets chatty and proceeds to tell Mackenzie who the hit teams were comprised of, where they were located, and that they had trained in Red Rock, Colorado. Now, Mackenzie goes back and forth to the bathroom, writing down these names, uh, stuffing them in his pockets. He's got his pants back on by this time, by the way. Various scraps of paper. <laughs> I don't forget anything. Yes. Yes. And um, records these names in a memoir many years later called The Men That Don't Fit In. And you can go on to Amazon, buy a copy of it, read it for yourself. Several weeks after the assassination, Mackenzie flees the country, probably saving his life. Now, I want to make this real clear right here and right now. This is not Rod McKenzie's story. This is Malcolm Wallace's story. So we're going to take a good look and see what Malcolm Wallace has to say. Now, I covered Malcolm Wallace last time. We got a bunch of new people, so we're going to go over his background again. Malcolm Wallace was Lyndon Johnson's personal hitman. He was a Texas native, and he was a real lantern-jawed tough guy, too. He was an ex-Marine, and he was highly intelligent. Wallace was also a college-educated man. He went to the University of Texas, where he later even taught a class, and supposedly went to Columbia. I say supposedly Columbia, because we're going to see another picture of Wallace a little later on. It's going to raise the Yale question. Did he go to Yale? Did he go to Columbia? Interesting school, Columbia. We just had some guy that just did eight years in the White House, and he told everyone he went to Columbia, yet there's not one single person who went there at the same time who ever remembers even seeing him there, including his teachers. <laughs> yes. Now, Wallace gets hooked up with Lyndon Johnson in 1950, uh, through the Department of Agriculture, he gets on his staff. And in 1951, he starts killing people for him. You see, right around this time, Lyndon Johnson's got a little bit of a problem. He's got this party girl sister named Josepha, who he later has killed. And she's a sometimes hooker. She's a bisexual. She loves drinking. She loves drugs. And she's got a big, fat mouth. She's also banging this guy named John Douglas Kinzer. And Kinzer's stooping Malcolm Wallace's estranged wife. So you see, this part of the story is not going to have a happy ending. Not to mention, Kinzer's making a little bit of noise like he wants to shake Johnson down for a buck or two. That's not a good idea either. One day, Wallace hops in his car. He drives out from the greater D.C. area to outside Austin, Texas, where he pulls into the parking lot of the Butler Park Pitch and Putt Golf Pro Shop. Say that five times fast. 
He pulls in there, walks into the joint, sees Kinzer there, pulls out a 1911 Colt 45 and blows him away in broad daylight. Hops in his car and just drives away. Now, the, cop, the cops catch Wallace literally within minutes. He's got out-of-state plates, Virginia plates on his car, eyewitnesses seeing fleeing the crime scene. And when the cops pull the car over, he rolls the window down, sticks his head out the window and says, you can't arrest me. I work for Senator Lyndon Johnson. Well, they pull him out. They cuff him. They stuff him. They throw him in the jail. And he's going to go on trial for murder. During the trial, Lyndon Johnson rents a hotel room down the street from the courthouse. He's got runners going back and forth. He's got his top lawyer working on him. But Wallace is convicted of murder. But you don't want to know what his sentence was? Five years suspended. Five years suspended sentence for a murder rap in the state of Texas. I'm going to let that sink in for a minute, and I need a drink. But he wasn't black. <laughs> the judge, by the way, is a guy named Obetz, and he's a huge Lyndon Johnson supporter. Surprise, surprise. Bet you didn't see that one coming. Not only does Wallace walk, he walks into a brand new job, too. He starts working in aerospace, where he needs a top secret clearance to work. I want one person on this planet to sit me down and explain to me how a convicted murderer can get that kind of security clearance. How does that work? And by the way, I want him to buy me beers, and he's buying. I want to have a couple beers of that guy, yeah. Anyway, it gets better. Strap your seat belts on now, kids, because this is going to get real interesting. Here's Malcolm Wallace's fingerprint. It was found on a cardboard box on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Building, where we're told Lee Harvey Oswald did that miracle shooting job from. Six people also describe somebody who looks like Malcolm Wallace in those windows, not someone who looked like Lee Harvey Oswald. One of the witnesses was a guy named Richard Carr. And Richard Carr describes Wallace to a T, including the style of horn rim glasses that he's wearing. Says he sees the same guy running out of a side door of the building, hopping into a car and driving away right after the murder. Being a good citizen and all, he goes and he tells the Dallas Police Department. Dallas Police Department's now reporting everything to the FBI. In fact, they're going to be packing up all their evidence and shipping it off to the FBI, where Lyndon Johnson's best friend and next-door neighbor for years, J. Edgar Hoover, is going to be running the show. Over the next several years, Mr. Carr has no less than four attempted assassinations on his life, by knife, by gun, and someone trying to put a bomb in his car. He survives. Malcolm Wallace himself is killed in a freak single-accident car crash in his home state of Texas in 1971. One night, he just drives his pickup truck right off the road. Now, Wallace was an extremely heavy drinker his entire adult life, and he often drove drunk. But somebody must have really not wanted Wallace to come home that night because they rigged his pickup truck so the carbon monoxide goes into the truck cabin. And Malcolm Wallace will not be down for breakfast. Now, not only does Wallace's fingerprint put him on the sixth floor, not only do eyewitnesses put Wallace on the sixth floor, but in his conversation with Mackenzie in that hotel room with the girls, he puts himself on the sixth floor. But Wallace claims he's not alone. So we're going to call this the sixth floor team. So who else is up there with Wallace? This guy, Loy Factor. Loy Factor was an American Indian of the Chickasha tribe, and he was living in Oklahoma at the time. And um, exactly how he was approached and recruited for this, I don't really know. But he had met Wallace a couple years before in Texas. And Loy Factor was a hell of a shot. I mean, this guy could knock the pips off a dice at 100 yards. And he was incredible. Uh, Loy claims he was also paid $10,000 for this job. Now, $10,000 doesn't sound like a lot of money. But in 1963, I went on to a, um, a site that said what the average income of a person was. In 1963, John Q. Public out there was making only $4,300. That's for the year, yearly salary. So 10 grand is the equivalent of about 115 to maybe $145,000 today in cash. So that's real money. There's nutcases that'll pay you $145,000 to take a shot at the president. You know? There were people in Dallas that would kill you for five bucks. There we go. At that time. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. Now, Loy was picked up in um, Oklahoma by a Hispanic lady named Esperanza Martinez. We're going to talk about her in a minute. He was driven into Dallas a, a few days before the assassination where he stayed at, quote, a little house. And I don't know where it was. Apparently, there's about five safe houses in Dallas at that time. And um, 
<clears throat> he was paid $2,000 up front. After the assassination, Esperanza Martinez took Loy to a bus station, paid him the other eight, put him on a bus, and he went home. Now, Loy got in a little bit of trouble later on in life. He was convicted of murdering his wife, something that he denied up until his very last days that he did. And um, he spent decades in prison. Now, Loy admitted to um, a couple of Kennedy researchers that, yes, he was in Dallas. Yes, he was in that building. He had a rifle. But he deliberately shot wild, apparently getting cold feet at the last minute. Could have been the bullet that hit the curb. So who knows? And Loy passed away, I think, in 1994 or 1995. Yes. That guy couldn't miss. Yeah. Couldn't miss. Esperanza Martinez. Interesting. This is a hit lady. Uh, who told people she was Puerto Rican. Turns out she's probably Corsican or Spanish. And uh, her mother had worked for OSS during assa for assassinations during World War II, uh, some kind of Nazi disposal, I'm sure of. So the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree here. Uh, she also went by the name of Ruth Ann Martinez and Hope Martinez. Uh, she was a frequent flyer on the ZR flat store and traveled around in that carnival outfit for several months. She also stayed for a very short time at the permanent safe house in Dallas, Texas. In a conversation with Mackenzie one time, she talked about how she killed her clientele. She would have sex with some poor slob and then take a hat pin and stick it through his ear right in the middle of the act, where she then exclaimed, they die happy, they die happy. And Mackenzie said that just completely unnerved her. Since she twisted it, too. Yeah, yeah. Ugh. Yeah, she sounds like a real fun date. I asked if she had a propeller on the end of it. No, no propeller on the end of it. Yeah. Now, the night before, she stay, she's seen at the La Cabana Hotel partying it up with other Hispanics, probably Cubans. And who's also there having a good time with them? Frank Sturgis. That'd be CIA asset and killer Frank Sturgis, which we're going to talk about later. His girlfriend, Marita Lorenz. And um, who should pull up in a car and sit there and chat with him for several minutes? Richard Milhouse Nixon. Nixon's name is going to pop up so many times you could make it a drink. He went inside with him. He went inside with him too? Yeah, it's sitting there. Okay. Okay. Yeah, a couple of now, after the assassination, Esperanza Martinez takes off to Louisiana, possibly with mafia pilot David Ferry. That's just my speculation. And um, this picture of her was taken in the 1970s. At this time, her mother, who was still alive. It's quite a possibility Esperanza Martinez is still alive today. Um, Esperanza, we're recording this, so if you're out there, uh, send me an email or friend me on Facebook. I'd like to talk to you and um, leave your hat pins at home. We're just going to talk. <laughs> yes. <laughs> just a little bit. Now, according to Wallace, who else is up on the sixth floor? Lee Harvey Oswald. Now, before everybody flips their whole stack of pancakes and gets all excited, I'm not saying he was involved in the assassination. I don't believe he was. But Wallace says something very, very strange here to Mackenzie. He says, Oswald's up there under a spell. Spell. That was the exact word. Yeah. Now, could he mean hypnotic spell? Now, Oswald's weirdo buddy, David Ferry, who he had met at age 15 in the Civil Air Patrol, was an expert in hypnotism. And he often hypnotized a lot of those boys in that Civil Air Patrol. David Ferry was also working on an MK Ultra mind control experiment for the CIA. At least he had the paperwork on it. Now, at this particular time, uh, there was a stage magician named Raymond Corbin. Went by the stage name Raymond, and he had like a horror theme. Slept in his own coffin, all sorts of crazy stuff. He'd saw people in half and everything. Raymond Corbin also had ties to Dr. Ewan Cameron. That's MK Ultra Mind Control Dr. Ewan Cameron. Look him up on the internet. And also he had ties to Colonel Michael Aquino. That would be the satanic head of the Church of Set, Michael Aquino, who was also head of psychological warfare for the United States military. And guess where Raymond Corbin was that weekend? He's in Dallas, Texas. Now before I get accused of connecting dots that don't exist, I'm not saying I know what the hell Raymond Corbin was doing there. I just find this whole thing to be very strange because we know this MK Ultra mind control assassination stuff is real. Look at Bobby Kennedy's killing. Sirhan Sirhan wanders into that pantry. He's got an eight-shot revolver, somehow manages to shoot 14 bullets out of it. And he's no closer to Bobby Kennedy than six feet in front of him, yet Bobby Kennedy shot point-blank range in the back of the head underneath his armpit. 
But Sirhan Sirhan can't remember anything because he's under a deep state of hypnosis. Now, this is not conspiracy theory stuff. This is mainstream news. The guy can't remember anything. Now, here's what I think happened. This is my speculation. I think Oswald was upstairs in that room for a short time. He was under hypnotism or he was acting like he was under hypnotism, where he had that freaking gun in his hand, as anyone's guess. I personally don't believe he ever saw that rifle. A couple minutes before the hit parade goes off, Oswald goes downstairs out the front door where he's photographed in the doorway of the book building. And we know that because we got a copy of the photo. Here's Oswald right here. Kennedy's driving by. Kennedy's already been hit by at least one shot by now. Now, how do we know this is Lee Harvey Oswald? Let's blow it up and find out. Here's a 50-point match to Oswald. Now, this, this uh, photo array was put together by my buddy and fellow uh, researcher, Richard Hook. And when I first saw this, I called Richard up on the phone. I'm like, Richard, man, this is awesome. You got a 50-point match to Oswald. He said, no, Brian, I have a 72-point match to Oswald. I couldn't fit the other 22 points on the display card. <laughs> so if Oswald's in the doorway, he ain't in the window. Now, according to Wallace, there's another crew here in this building that he refers to as the command area on the second floor. And who do we have here? Let's check it out. Cliff Carter. Cliff Carter was Lyndon Johnson's lawyer and personal confidant for years. And also, according to Wallace, he attended the Murkison meeting the night before. Now, Clint Murkison, we went over this last time. We'll go over it again real quick. Clint Murkison was a Texas uh, millionaire, an oil guy. And um, he had like a little mini ranch right there in the middle of Dallas, right there in the city. And the night before Kennedy's killed, he has a party at that ranch. Attendees of that party are Lyndon Johnson, Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon, the drinking game, comes up again. Um, uh, John J. McCloy, who was a future member of the Warren Commission and personal buddy of Adolf Hitler, sat in his box there at the Berlin Games. And... Uh, uh, well, so Gerald Ford, future member of the Warren Commission, is there. George Bush Sr. is there. He's, he's a CIA, future head of CIA, future president of the United States. Texas oil tycoon H.L. Hunt and um, J. Edgar Hoover and uh, Clyde Tolson from the FBI, amongst others. Now, when Lyndon Johnson gets out of that meeting very late at night, he arrived very late, most people there didn't even expect to see him. He told his girlfriend, Madeline Brown, who he had a kid with, who also attended that meeting, come tomorrow, those blankety-blank Kennedy brothers are never going to embarrass me again. That's not a threat, that's a promise. And before the first shot rang out in Daly Plaza the next day, Lyndon Johnson's already face down in the back seat of that car. So he knew it was coming. Cliff Carter was born in 1918, and uh, he had met Lyndon Johnson on Johnson's first campaign for office. And he was involved in fundraising, that kind of stuff. And during World War II, he even served in the, uh, in the Army and was even decorated. He got, uh, he got a Bronze Star from the United States government and some award from the French government. I can't. He got the what? Corps de Guerre. How can I'm, I never remember that name? We were talking about that the other day. Yeah, I, I need to drink more, less Chianti, more Bordeaux, and then I'll remember that, that name. When he gets back to the United States, he uh, gets hooked up with a soda bottling outfit and does quite well for himself financially. And uh, him and Johnson get reacquainted, and the two become thick as thieves, literally thieves. And um, I also believe that it's uh, Cliff Carter who's the go-between between, between Lyndon Johnson and hitman Malcolm Wallace, that if Lyndon Johnson wants anyone taken care of, he tells Carter, Carter tells Wallace, Wallace makes it happen. I'm 100% convinced of that chain of command. Wallace was a good friend of Johnson's way back. Yes. Yeah. Before all this. Before all this stuff, too. Yeah. Now, after the assassination, Cliff Carter becomes head of the Democratic National Committee. But he doesn't last too long because there's a big, huge financial scandal. He, gets, he has to resign. Uh, Cliff Carter passed away in 1971. He was in his early 50s, which is just fine with me because uh, I don't think he had a decent bone in his body. If he did, he had it surgically removed so he could be pure evil. No, he was a lawyer. Yeah, yeah. Got one of Satan's certificates there. Now, here's a guy I've never heard of before, a guy named George Reese. This is what Wallace puts up in here. The only thing I know about Reese is he was a known hitman. He was part of the Texas mob. He was from Abilene, Texas, and uh, 
he had attended, according to Wallace, the Mercus meeting the night before. And I can't find anything on him. I can't find an arrest record. I'm not a private investigator, so I only have yeah, certain things. You can't things. find anything on me. No, I can't find anything on you either. You've got a lot of money trying. Yes. <laughs> so anyway, if anybody else here knows anything about George Reese, I'd like to hear about it. it. Sounds like an interesting character. Jack Ruby is put on the second floor by Wallace. Now, this doesn't surprise me at all, because Ruby was seen all over Daly Plaza that day. He's over here. He's over there. So if Wallace wants to put him on the second floor for a short time, it actually makes perfect sense to me. Jack Ruby, uh, his real name was Jacob Rubenstein. He was a nice Jewish boy from Chicago who had mob ties his whole life. Uh, as a kid, he's basically working for Al Capone's outfit. Um, he, is also in, he was also involved in running guns and things into Cuba. I also believe he was involved in drug operations in Cuba and possibly bringing currency is there as well. His best friend was a guy named Louis McWillie. And Louis McWillie was Santo Traficante's number one guy out of, um, uh, in Havana there. And Santo Traficante was a mob boss of Florida, working out of Tampa. And Traficante was also a guy who then Senator Kennedy, before he was president, he went to, um, he went to go visit Havana, and Traficante threw him a nice little multi-girl sex party for him. That's pretty nice of him. You know who that? That's Alice that's Alexander. Yeah, I also hope Senator again. You don't remember her name? No. Okay. Somebody blonde said that was pathetic. Okay. <laughs> See, you got me distracted. Yeah, well, yes. They got me distracted. <laughs> yeah. I can understand that. Uh, so where were we? Uh, uh, Ruby in Cuba. Okay. When uh, Santo Traficante was arrested by Fidel Castro, and probably going to have him uh, killed, Jack Ruby went and got him out. So, now, Jack Ruby was also, a popular, was also an informant for a popular American politician for quite a while. And that politician's name was Richard Milhouse Nixon. Take another drink. And um, the, the uh, politician who introduces Ruby to Nixon is Lyndon Johnson. Is this getting weird enough for everybody? Because it's getting weird enough for me. One other thing. Yes. That's the exact office, right? This is the part of it uh -huh. where I met Jack Ruby. Okay. <laughs> what happened? All right. <laughs> don't, don't ask him what happened. We're going to save that for a question and answer afterwards. Calm down, please. In 1963, Jack Ruby's running a nightclub called the Carousel. And in that nightclub, he's seen talking with Lee Harvey Oswald and Oswald's weirdo buddy, David Ferry. In fact, David Ferry was there so often, one of the dancers thought he was the manager of the joint, which he wasn't. Now, Jack Ruby had known Lee Harvey Oswald since Oswald was a kid. Oswald's uh, father had died a month or two before he was born. And um, when he grows up, his mother likes to date mafia guys. In fact, Oswald was from a hooked-up family. His uncle was a guy named Charles Dutz Morant, and he was a lieutenant in Carlos Marcello's outfit. And Carlos Marcello was the head of the New Orleans Mafia. Also, this, uh, this club that he's got is a big, huge cop hangout. Ruby literally knows hundreds of Dallas police officers by name. You tell me how a guy like Jack Ruby can smuggle a gun past 75 armed police officers and shoot the most famous person in U.S. custody live on television if he doesn't know somebody. Right? Here's this famous uh, Ruby shooting Oswald here. Here's this guy right here in a white don't shoot me costume. Uh, claims he didn't have a dark suit to wear that day. Turns out he's full of duty. And uh, anybody else notice anything interesting about this picture? Anything weird? Yes. Ruby's pulling the trigger with his middle finger. That's an assassination technique. Human beings have the uncanny ability to point with extreme accuracy. And you line your finger up against the barrel of a snubby pistol, and you're going to hit anything you're pointing at at close range. Nobody on the planet reaches into their pocket and pulls it. Ruby's ready to go. Call three point. Three point. Both eyes. You learn to focus when you're a child mm -hmm. within seven or eight weeks. And that's a very difficult thing, by the way. Mm -hmm. And then the pointing of your finger, point the finger. is the same as you're always doing that all your life. Okay. And that's what happens. All right. Yeah. Now, who taught Jack Ruby how to do this? I don't know. But somebody did. Someone showed him what to do. Now, Ruby's, of course, he piled on by the police right there. We've all seen the, the, the video of it. And um, 
Oh, thanks for closing the door, by the way. And he's hauled off to jail, claims that he shot uh, Oswald out of some twisted patriotic loyalty to Jackie Kennedy. And he's sitting there in the jail for three years, and the whole time he's there, he's begging to be taken to Washington, D.C. He says, I got a big story to tell. And uh, no one's going to know the ins and outs of this Kennedy thing until you take me to D.C. He's never taken there. <laughs> One day he's given an injection. He just starts screaming, I've just been injected with cancer. And Jack Ruby dies weeks later of a very aggressive form of cancer. So, well, the official cause of death is a blood clot. Who knows what he really died of, actually. But he was being treated for cancer while he was in the jail. So. According to Wallace, Carlos Marcello was there. Carlos Marcello was the head of the New Orleans Mafia, and he was one of the most powerful organized crime figures in the history of this country, and almost no one has ever even heard of him. Well, either that or he was just an innocent little tomato salesman, like he said he was, you know, one or the other. You know, you got to like some of these mob guys. You know, John Gotti, he just sold plumbing equipment. You know, <laughs> Carlos Marcello, he just sold tomatoes. Now, Carlos Marcello was sometimes known as the little man. He was only five foot two, but he was no pushover. He was tough, he was ruthless, and he was highly intelligent. You don't get to be the head of a huge mafia operation if you don't have these traits. Now, Marcello was, uh, his parents were Sicilian, but he wasn't born in Sicily or the United States. He was born in North Africa, in Tunisia. And he moved to the United States when he was a little guy. And I mean little, he was only one or two years old when he, when he came to the United States. And for some stupid reason that I can't figure out, Marcello never became a U.S. citizen. And this got him into huge trouble. The government kept trying to deport him for years, never was able to do it. His bribes and battery of lawyers, I'm sure, kept him out of jail and or kept him out of deportation. Now, <clears throat> Marcello got involved in a lot of penny-ante crimes and stuff like that when he was a kid, breaking and entering, burglaries. And um, when age 18, he was even involved in a bank robbery which he got caught for and didn't do much time. Now, Marcello got his real big kickstart in the mafia when in the early 1930s, Mayor LaGuardia out of New York City is getting rid of the slot machine rackets there. I don't know if any of you guys ever seen those old newsreels like on the A&E channel, the Bill Curtis type of shows. It'll show LaGuardia's out there, and big publicity. He's got a sledgehammer. He's banging on these slot machines. We're going to get rid of these one-armed bandits, and they put them all on a barge, and they dump them out in the ocean. Big, huge uh, uh, publicity stunt, in my opinion. Well, the head of the mafia at the time in New York City was a guy named Frank Costello. And Frank Costello was really good buddies with Joseph P. Kennedy, President Kennedy's father. Interesting. And Costello's getting sick and tired of the headaches he's getting in New York City, so he's going to move the whole slot machine racket that he's got down to Louisiana, where he can pay off politician Huey P. Long and, uh, to run that operation there. And Carlos Marcello gets a nice, big, fat slice of that pie. And this rockets Marcello into an empire of gambling. At the height of his career, Marcello controlled gambling operations in multiple cities and multiple states. At one particular time, he's paying Lyndon Johnson tens of thousands of dollars a month just to run his gambling operation in Texas alone. Marcello's raking in millions. But this gets him to the attention of Bobby Kennedy. In the 50s, Bobby Kennedy's going after the mafia like this country's never even heard of before. And he's getting all these gangsters, getting them in there to get all these hearings and stuff. He's sweating them out. And Marcello's getting a really big headache because Bobby Kennedy even has such a bad thing for Marcello. He has him literally kidnapped off the streets of Louisiana. That was Keith That was Keith Albert. Bobby Kennedy was so top of that army. Keith by being a little pit bull. Yes, Bobby Kennedy was the little pit bull. Anyway, Marcello and his lawyer are coming out of a building, a guy named Frank Regano, and uh, they put him on a plane, and they literally dumped him into the jungles of Guatemala. Because Marcello had a passport said he was a citizen of Guatemala. So I was like, oh, here you go. Marcello almost died. Here's this little dude running around in alligator shoes. He's got a silk jacket and stuff on. He's going through the jungles of Guatemala. He's got broken ribs. He's totally dehydrated. Three days in the jungle there. And when he gets back to the United States, he vows he's going to kill Bobby Kennedy. Now, before both Kennedy brothers were killed, there was a nightclub promoter from Las Vegas named Ed Becker. Comes out and visits Marcello, and they're chatting away, and the Kennedys come up in conversation. And Marcello simply said, you chop off the dog's head and the tail stops wagging. It means you killed President Kennedy. Bobby Kennedy's not going to have any power. And that's exactly what happened. 
Just a couple of days after Kennedy's assassination, J. Edgar Hoover, who, by the way, hated both the Kennedy's guts, goes into his office and rips a telephone right out of the wall, which connected him and Bobby Kennedy's office. And the FBI investigation in the mafia went down to about 20 to 25 percent of what it was. And it wasn't until the get Gotti uh, days in the early 1980s when the FBI was uh, back into or organized crime again. So, very interesting. Now, Marcello did end up doing about three, three years in jail. They did get him on something. And the FBI had an informant in the jail. And according to that informant, Carlos Marcello told him that he took credit for killing uh, President Kennedy. And Marcello was one of a handful of mobsters who talked about killing President Kennedy before he was killed and took some degree of credit after he was killed. And Marcello did not die in jail. He died in his 80s on his own property, which is rare for mobsters to do. Now here we have a big, huge, fat problem. We're told there's no way on earth Marcello could be in Dallas, Texas then because he's sitting in a courtroom in Louisiana during one of his deportation hearings. That was one of my big questions. Yeah. After I, the next day when I started going through those papers. It didn't um, make sense to you? I heard that my son was down there in uh, New Orleans. Yes. And well, I have, a, I have an interesting take on this. see. Put it down the way that Wallace did the said. thing, but uh, I was always skeptical of it. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of people are skeptical. And I screwed up on Nicoletti, too. Yeah, we'll get to Nicoletti yeah. here. We're not going to leave him out. He's one of my favorite no. characters. <laughs> yes. Now, <clears throat> we're told Mark Carlos Marcello is sitting in a courtroom in Louisiana. Who are we told that by? We're told that by the FBI, who's involved in the cover-up since day one. And we're told that by a very specific FBI guy, this guy Regis Kennedy. No relation as far as I know. But Regis Kennedy said, oh, I saw Marcello and David Ferry sitting in that courtroom. But Regis Kennedy is also the guy that confiscates Beverly Oliver's home movie footage of the Kennedy assassination, which has never been seen to this day. He goes over to her house, takes the camera, takes the film, and it disappears. He carried my nickname for him to the step. Yeah? No neck. No neck? That's what I call him. Okay. <laughs> so you're distracting me again. We're going to be here till next Christmas. Okay. You should do it right. Yes. <laughs> Well, there was a, there was a famous comedian in, in the early 1990s, a guy named Bill Hicks, who I believe was murdered. And, um, but he used to talk about the Kennedy assassination a lot in his um, stand-up routines. And Bill Hicks used to say when they get a new president in, they put him into a room, they close the doors, a screen comes down, and a view of the Kennedy assassination footage that's never been seen before is shown to him. And then the screen slides up, and a voice over a loudspeaker goes, Any questions? <laughs> Who knows, it's Beverly Oliver's film. It could be, you know. Now, I think as researchers, we need to dig a little deeper into this Marcello thing. Was he in Dallas or was he in that courtroom? It's big, an interesting thing. And it's interesting, in his conversation with McKenzie, Wallace got right up in McKenzie's face and he said, Marcello wouldn't have missed this for the world. Sure. Yeah. So maybe we need to dig a little deeper. See if he was there or not. Uh, according to many people, Marcello was at the Murkison meeting the night before. And I'm pretty sure that, that happened. Yeah. In the alley behind the fence, Wallace puts another hit team there. Who do we got? Two guys I never heard of, Clyde Faust and John Ernst. The only thing that I was told is that they were part of the Texas mob. I have no idea. I can't, again, I can't find arrest records, drivers, nothing I can find on the Internet about these guys. So if somebody knows anything about him, I'd like to know. Also with them is a guy named Jack Grimm, very interesting character, Texas oil man. Uh, Jack Grimm was originally from Oklahoma, and his grandfather used to tell him all these stories about buried treasure out in the middle of nowhere, out in the southwest. And, and when he was a kid, he was about 14 years old, he got a hold of a bunch of dynamite, and he blew up a riverbed looking for buried treasure, and he found nothing. Uh, he served in the Marine Corps in World War II, and when he gets back to the United States, he uses his GI Bill to study geology. And uh, then he moves to Texas to become what's called a wildcatter, and that's a guy who's drilling holes all over everywhere looking for, looking for oil. And he's using his geology skills to get the lay of the land and figure out all the rock formations and all that kind of stuff, the best place to find oil. And right before he goes completely bankrupt, he strikes it big, and he's a millionaire. But he uses his money for weird stuff. 
He's up here in the Northwest looking for Bigfoot. He goes into Scotland looking for the Loch Ness Monster. He's traveling around the, the uh, Atlantic looking for the wreck of the Andrea Doria and the Titanic. And according to some people, he found both. And he says when he finds the Titanic, he's going to raise it. Anyway, he's, he's got a picture there with the model. And he's talking about he's going to pull the thing up out of the ocean, which, of course, he never did. And um, he even sends a, a, a film team into the mountains in, uh, in Turkey looking for Noah's Ark. So he's doing all sorts of strange stuff with his money. Yes. Who made the movie Gold? That was about him. Oh, the movie Gold was about him? Yeah. Okay. I don't know who made it, but that was it's supposed to be directly about him. Okay. Interesting. Now, I don't know what Jack Grimm's job was on that hit team. I don't know if he's just an observer, uh, whatever. But uh, he passed away in 1995. Very strange guy. And here's a guy I'd never heard of until recently either, until Mackenzie told me about him. A guy named Joseph P. Dugan. And the only source I have is Mackenzie himself. And we don't have a picture, so I had, I had Mackenzie draw me one. So this is Joe, Joe Dugan here. Joe Dugan was originally from Ireland and moved to Canada when he was a kid. And in uh, World War II, he uh, lied about his age and got into the Army. He was a big guy. A lot of guys did that. A lot of guys in the United States did that, too. He gets, part, he, he gets attached to an outfit called the First Special Service Force, nicknamed the Devil's Brigade. And if you want to see a great movie on World War II, watch Devil's Brigade. It's my favorite World War II movie. It's got William Holden in it and Carol O'Connor and Cliff Robertson, and it's just fantastic. And uh, they saw a lot of heavy action in World War II. Now, First Special Service Force has a website that has a roster of most of the people. They admit not everyone. But um, I tried to find Joe Dugan's name on there, and I couldn't find it. Now, that doesn't surprise me a lot, because Dugan often used aliases. He went by the name Brunin. He went by the name Sullivan and several others. So if he lied about his age, he might have lied about his name. I don't know. I couldn't find his name in that roster. Now, after he gets out of the Army, he gets hooked up with organized crime outfits in Canada and eventually makes his way into Chicago, where he becomes a cleaner. Now, a cleaner is an interesting job because a cleaner will get rid of dead bodies for you. He also cleans up crime scenes and that kind of stuff. He arranges assassination teams, and he carries out contract murders himself. He's like a one-stop shop for all your contract murder needs. He also... If I, sold weapons, too. He sold... Well, I'm going to get to that weapon part. You're getting ahead of me. I'm going to put this out in your eye. Okay. <laughs> I watch. Yes. So he also had, in Chicago, he also had a legitimate gig. He was a beer distributor. And Mackenzie said that Jugan just had incredible strength. He'd pick up these big, huge beer kegs and swing them all around all day long and never seemed to get tired. Now, weeks before the Kennedy assassination, Dugan is seen in Dallas, Texas. What he was doing there, I'm not really sure. But Mackenzie also said that Dugan cleaned up the safe house with a crew of people a few days after the assassination that Mackenzie had been moved out of the uh, safe house a couple weeks before, stayed at the Cabana Hotel. And um, when he gets back after the assassination, the whole place is redone. New walls, new paint, new carpet, new fixtures, new furniture. The whole place is different. And this is obviously to get rid of any human uh, uh, things in there. I was used to. Yes. And also, if anyone's compromised, they can no longer accurately describe the interior of the place. Dugan cleaned it up. Now, eventually, Dugan makes his way up here to Seattle in the late 1970s, early 80s. He's living in Chinatown. And uh, he's also got two rooms at the Publix Hotel in Chinatown filled full of guns, including fully automatic, silenced Ingram machine guns, which is a lot of fun. And he's selling them out of there. And one of his clients is the um, chi local Chinese gangsters that live down there. In Seattle, in 1983, we had something called a Wa Mi Massacre. Anybody remember that? where three psychopathic maniacs walk into the Wami Mee Club, Quan Willie Mack, Tony Ning, and uh, I think Benjamin Ning. And they, they walk in there, and they gun down 14 people in cold blood, one survivor. I'm 95% convinced Dugan sold them the guns. Very interesting. Now, one day, Dugan is approached by a couple of shady characters out of Chicago, want him to go in on a gold bullion heist. He takes off. He's never heard of again. I don't know what happened to him. I don't know if, he's, if he got killed by these guys, if he was arrested, or if he spent the rest of his life uh, drinking little uh, umbrella drinks on a beach somewhere. 
I have no idea. Dugan's an interesting guy. Under the bridge above in the railroad area, Wallace puts another hit team there. And who do these guys turn out to be? The so-called three tramps. These are three guys pulled off a railroad car literally down the street from where Kennedy was killed. Uh, they were questioned by the police, and then they were let go. Uh, we're going to see a lot of this catch and release stuff, the, the rest of this. And by the way, this cop right here has a Ku Klux Klan symbol on his sleeve. That's pretty nice of him, you know. It helped in the police department, which was uh, one, the Dallas PD, which is 100% white at the time. If you were a member of the John Birch Society or the KKK, you could go up the totem pole a little quicker than everybody else could if you wanted to make rank. Now, it's, uh, Wallace explains who these guys are. First guy here is a guy named Charles Frederick Rogers. He's an interesting guy. Uh, he joined the Navy at a fairly young age, and Charles turns out to be pretty bright because one of the things he likes to do in his spare time is study nuclear physics, something he gets a degree in later. Mackenzie described him once to me as, quote, a half-baked radio communications genius. Oh, he, was he said there was absolutely nothing Rogers didn't know about radios. He said Rogers was so brilliant he could tape two cardboard boxes together and make a radio out of it. That's how sharp he was. Uh, Rogers had also been a member of the Civil Air Patrol, and he knew David Ferry. Him and David Ferry were seen together multiple times. In 1956, Rogers gets hooked up with CIA. Now we know what he was doing there. He's part of a hit team. Now in 1965, Rogers does two kind of interesting things. He takes a hammer and he kills his parents. He chops him up and puts some of his body parts down in a sewer kind of thing there. And he disappears from the continental United States, never to officially be seen again. In 1975, Rogers is declared legally dead. Now, what happened to him, I really don't know. There's various stories about Rogers that he was sent to Central South America as a torture killer for CIA. I tend to believe that story myself, um, that he was part of Iran-Contra and eventually killed in Honduras, you know, some which all these stories may or may not be true. So. This guy's going to look and sound familiar to most people in this room. This is Charles Harrelson. This is actor Woody Harrelson's father. You can see the resemblance right here. The chip off the old block type of thing. Except Charles here was a very, very bad boy. Uh, he got involved with organized crime as a young guy. He was even a heroin trafficker for a short time. And he was also a contract killer for the mob. Now, Woody Harrelson's on record saying he believes his father was a CIA-trained assassin who killed people for the CIA. Now, Woody Harrelson's a little bit of a strange dude, but he's not a Hollywood idiot. He's pretty bright, and I think when he says something like that, we should listen to him. Anyway, we know Harrelson was a killer because he was actually convicted of two separate murders. One of those was a judge. How did he kill the judge? He took a rifle and he shot him in the head from some distance away. Does that method of execution sound familiar to anybody in this room? Now, the last time Harrelson's arrested, he's coked up out of his mind. He was a big doper. And he's screaming at the police that it surrounded the building that he's in. He says, I was in Dallas, and I took a shot at the president. Although years later in jail, a British television company comes out and films him where he denies any involvement. Although he said that picture, when he's walking, it looks just like him. He passed away in 2007. Now, Mackenzie told me that Rogers and Harrelson were a murder duo team, that they used to travel around the United States taking on contract murders together. Well, here they're together in 63. They're on the same team. Is this a coincidence? I don't think so. Excuse me? They went overseas. They went overseas, too? Yeah, but that Bowen bunch. Okay, we're going to get to Bowen in a minute, too. Now, here's an interesting picture right here. This is from the Nix film. There were several films taken of the Kennedy assassination, not just we, everyone has heard of the Zapruder film. Well, the Nix film is one of Morville Nix took this picture. They've all been doctored as far as I'm concerned. But somebody missed something here. Here's a blow-up of it. Here's a guy with a rifle. I mean, plain as day. You, you can't not miss that. This, a lot of people think, is Harrelson because he's got this big, huge Frankenstein head, which, by the way, that was his nickname, was Frankenstein. So I don't know if it's Harrelson for sure. But I'm 95 percent. It looks like Richard Holt. <laughs> Calm down. Chauncey Holt, the third tramp. Chauncey Marvin Holt was a very interesting character. Um, had between 25 and 30 different aliases. 
uh, including, here we go again, the official CIA moniker, John Moon. And uh, Chauncey joined the Army Air Corps at a young age. He wasn't too keen on the Army life, and when Pearl Harbor lights up, Chauncey goes AWOL. And uh, he got involved with some young guys who had stolen a car. And uh, they're driving around a little bit, and they get nabbed by the feds. Chauncey goes to a reformatory. In the reformatory, he meets members of organized crime, one of which later becomes a member of the Licavoli crime family later on in the 1950s. Now, when Chauncey gets out of, the, out of the reformatory, he starts working for organized crime. And Chauncey turns out to be a gold mine. Hey, he's a good-looking guy. He's got the gift of gab. He's brilliant with numbers. Chauncey's so good with numbers, he ends up doing bookworking and accounting for mob outfits for years. Years. He's uh, got natural artistic ability, so he's forging documents and doing fun stuff like that. That's a self-portrait. Chauncey painted that. It's pretty good. He absorbs languages like a sponge, and he can fly a plane. I mean, Chauncey's so good at his job, he's later hired by gangster Meyer Lansky to come and work for him. One of Chauncey's many gigs is he works out of an outfit every once in a while in the greater Los Angeles area called Lasco, which is owned by Meyer Lansky and the CIA. And what do they do? They make badges for law enforcement. <laughs> Hollywood screenwriters can't write this stuff. If you put that in a movie, nobody would believe it. Chauncey, by Chauncey Holt's own ad, um, admission, he takes a handful of Secret Service badges that he cooks up in that outfit, hops into a car with two gangsters, one being Chucky Nicoletti out of Chicago. We're going to talk about him in a minute. He's a real fun guy. And um, they drive to Dallas, Texas. Many years later, Chauncey Holt is interviewed by a, a couple of Kennedy researchers who film him. He's also filmed by his daughter or videotaped. And a, a documentary is made on Chauncey's life, and nine days later, Chauncey's dead. Now, I find that to be an interesting timing thing. Now, Chauncey was getting a little up there in years, but I find his death to be suspect. I don't know if he's killed or not. Now, when Chauncey was there in Dallas, he had said on one of those little interviews with his daughter, he said it looked like a hitman convention when he was there. He said he literally saw contract killers from all over the world wandering around in Daly Plaza that day. When McKenzie was there, he said it looked like a mob convention. He said he saw gangsters from Florida, Las Vegas and Chicago wandering around. Very interesting. Then there's a guy named Dimitri who was not arrested with him. And I can find very little on him. But uh, the only thing I can find on this Dimitri, he is mentioned in some Kennedy paper. It starts with a T. I can't remember the name of it. I should have written that one down. And um, he was an ex-Baptist minister who converted to Russian Orthodox faith and later became an archbishop. And he has some connections to the Oswalds. Not entirely sure what it is. Yeah, just about the same thing. He, I would almost be busted that he and Ferry were buddies. Oh, yeah. I can imagine him and, and David Ferry knowing each totally other. The same thing. Yeah. But David Ferry was Roman Catholic. But it was a different year. But it's the same kind of. Yes. Yeah. yeah. To you. Yeah. And anyway, Dimitri is a very strange guy. I really don't have that much information on him. But he's associated with an outfit called the ACCC, which stands for the American Council of Christian Churches. And when I first heard about this, I bet myself $100 that this was an intelligence front. And I should have bet myself more money because it turns out to be true. The ACCC isn't started by a bunch of ministers who want to go and preach the gospel. No, it's started by these characters right here. It's an intelligence front used to spy on and carry out operations in Latin America. Lewis Mortimer Bloomfield, an ex-SOE colonel. That would be special operations executive, like secret agents in World War II. Sir William Stevenson, he was co-founder of Permindex, again, the uh, Mossad money laundering operation. And he's, he's an MI6 guy. And MI6 is responsible for forming Mossad. And J. Edgar Hoover from the FBI. That's who's uh, part of the, uh, this, this thing right here. And I decided to include one of their star members. This is a guy named Reverend Bowen. Uh, his real name was Albert Osborne. And he was a Baptist minister, and he was a Nazi. Now, I don't mean Nazi like you talk to some uh, you know, liberal Seattleite who, if you just disagree with them, all of a sudden you're a Nazi. I mean, this guy was a frickin' card-carrying, pin-wearing Nazi. He was the real deal. And uh, after World War II, um, Nazism wasn't quite so popular in this country. So he moves down to Mexico, where he gets involved in an orphanage, and what do they do in the orphanage? They train assassins. 
codenamed ZR rifles. And the ZR rifles would sometimes ride around on the ZR flat store. Now, I don't know what ZR stands for. We provided most of my, most of my clients. Most of your clients were ZR rifle okay, members? In one way, in one direction. Or another. That's yeah. interesting. And by the way, guess where Reverend Bowen was that weekend? He's in Dallas, Texas. Surprise, surprise. Reverend Bowen, give me a break. You know, it's funny because the last time I was reading the New Testament, I, I, I must have missed the part where Jesus told his followers to train your children to become contract assassins. I, I think I missed that part. Yeah. That's Joshua. <laughs> Calm down. There's a team in the Dow Techs building. We're going to find out who's there. Eugene Hale Brading, he's an interesting guy, a.k.a. Uh, James, uh, AKA Jim Braden, a.k.a. James Lee, uh, originally out of uh, uh, Kansas. And he was a rotten apple from day one. This kid, when he was a kid, he was involved in burglaries, all sorts of thefts and corruption. But when he gets older, he graduates from blue-collar crime to white-collar crime. And he's involved in all sorts of scams and schemes and rip-off ideas. And um, although he never met them, he did come to the attention of two gangster bosses. One was Sam Giancana out of Chicago, and the other one was a, uh, the uh, Tampa, Florida guy, um, uh, Santo Traficante. Now, <clears throat> he's arrested coming out of the Dell Tex building. One, he, he checks into the, the uh, uh, La Cabana Hotel, so we know he was in Dallas. He's there under his own name. And he's arrested coming out of the Dell Tex building. Another catch and release, because he's released very shortly after that. In 1964, he becomes a star member of a very exclusive um, country club in California called La Costa. And other members are politicians like Lyndon Johnson, Richard Nixon. There's Texas oil tycoons that are members there. And there's some gangsters, Sam Giancana and um, I think Carlos Marcello, definitely Johnny Rosselli. And also um, the uh, two FBI guys, J. Edgar Hoover and... Uh, and his little uh, allegedly gay boyfriend, Clyde Tolson, from the FBI. So we see all these guys are buddies. They're all hanging out together. Now, Eugene spent the last years of his life uh, ripping off old ladies for all their money. He got married these three different rich ladies at various times and took them for every penny they had. And um, he has ties to Bobby Kennedy's assassination, interesting enough. Yeah. Frank Sturgis, what a character. I wish somebody would write a book on him. They did? I don't know. I had never read it. Okay. okay. Well, anyway, I'm going to have to read a book on Frank Sturgis. He's a very interesting character. His uh, original name is Frank Fiorini. He's a nice Italian boy. He spoke fluent Italian. Uh, in his, um, he was born in the 1920s. When he was 17 years old, he joins the United States Marine Corps, and he fights in, uh, he fights in World War II. And he does a lot of behind the enemy lines type of stuff and had a, um, uh, had a reputation for being a very daring fighter, although I'm sure a lot of it is his own embellishment. In 1952, he changes his name officially to Sturgis, which I find weird because we have all these guys who use all these different aliases, but he changes his name, paperwork, and everything. And just out of curiosity, I went to one of these family registry sites where you look up where people's names originate from. It's French Norman, which means it's a Viking. When the Vikings settled in Norman, when Normandy, they cut off their beards and turned into Normans instead of Vikings. So it's originally a Danish name. So why would a nice Italian boy change his name to a Scandinavian name? I, I don't know. Well, we Scandinavians are pretty cool, actually. Who doesn't want to be us? So I guess I answered my own question. Now, in the 1950s, Frank Sturgis hooks up in the Sierra Mastrera with, um, with Fidel Castro and his crew of 400 uh, jolly followers and is involved in training there. Supposedly, he trains Che Guevara himself. Now, there's some controversy. Some people said that, no, Sturgis didn't train him himself. He, he, was, just, um, he was just there. Um, he was a supervisor. Well, he was there, and he was involved in training. Exactly what capacity, I don't know. Now, when Fidel Castro takes over and becomes, a, um, and becomes a big commie, everybody goes nuts. Sturgis becomes a part of an outfit called Operation 40, which is co-founded by Richard Nixon. Take another drink. And Sturgis and Nixon actually become good buddies. And Operation 40 is an American terrorist organization that goes into Cuba and blows stuff up and kills people and does all really nice, fun things like that. 
Now, Sturgis was also involved in the um, Watergate burglary, which sent Nixon away. Um, Sturgis at one time claimed publicly that he was a CIA assassin. He also called himself a whore of the CIA. Uh, right before Sturgis passed away, he was on numerous television shows and shilling out more disinformation on the Kennedy assassination than a human sprinkler system. So he's just throwing out all sorts of garbage and nonsense. And he passed away in the early 1990s. He was an extremely heavy smoker. And he basically smoked himself to death. And, yes? Yeah, on Sturgis, you're not bringing in Felix Rodriguez. And that's what you should be bringing in, because Sturgis used a lot of Felix Rodriguez's actual escapades and history. Interesting. OK. Uh, I made some of the documents up for him, so I don't okay. know that. All right. I didn't bring Rodriguez up because uh, uh, Wallace doesn't mention him. No. But, uh, look up mentioned, yeah, look up Felix Rodriguez. Dave yeah, I'm going to mention Morellis and Danny Arce and a couple of those at the end. Um, in his book, A Final Judgment, Michael Collins Piper outs Sturgis as a Haganah mercenary in 1948 when he fights in the first Arab-Israeli war. And according to that, he was friends with, he was good buddies with Mossad the rest of his entire life which doesn't surprise me there. Rafael Chichi Quintero, this is him right here. Uh, he had um, joined up with um, Fidel Castro when he was a pretty young guy. He was late teens, early 20s. And again, when, and, um, when Fidel Castro goes commie, he co-founds an organization called the MRR, which is the Movement to Restore the Revolution, because they were pissed. They got rid of one dictator. They didn't want another one. And that's what they ended up with. So he also, too, becomes part of Operation 40. And he has ties to CIA. He has direct ties to Oliver North, interesting enough. He had made a statement one time. He had said, if I were to tell what I know about the Bay of Pigs and what happened in Dallas, it would be the biggest controversy, I mean, the biggest scandal that has ever rocked this nation. Very interesting character there. By the way, I don't know what this patch is. I just find it interesting. It's got a little trident on it. So if anybody knows what that means, I'd like to know. Because I can't find it. It's almost like some kind of medical patch. It looks like a medical type patch. It's like, hmm. I don't know. Did they stick a trident in you and that's how you get better? I don't have any. I don't have one. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, it might be a Jewish thing with the trident. I don't know. Menorah. Menorah. Oh, I don't know. Okay. Richard Kane, really, really fascinating guy. His real name is Richard Scalzetti. Remember that name because we're going to come back to it. Richard Kane uh, was a uh, grew up in Chicago. He too was a uh, Italian. Uh, he spoke fluent Italian. He goes into the army in the late 1940s. Is stationed in the Virgin Islands or the Bahamas. I can't remember which one. And when he gets back, he speaks fluent Spanish. And um, according to some people, he spoke up to five languages. Pretty pretty bright guy. When he gets back uh, to Chicago, he becomes a police officer. He's also a made member of the Chicago or, uh, crime organization there, the mob there. He's an FBI informant, and he's a contractor for CIA. <laughs> Again, Hollywood screenwriters can't write that. If you put him in a movie, nobody would believe it. Richard Kane is allegedly to be a, a shooter or a spotter in the Dow Tex building. After the assassination, he goes back to Chicago. A few years go by. He's sitting in a, um, a little uh, restaurant called Rose's Sandwich Shop. And um, he's chatting up this attractive woman in a black dress. And a couple of gunmen walk in. They put everybody against the wall. One of the gunmen reaches into his pocket, pulls something out, puts it in his pocket, takes a shotgun, puts it to his head, and blows his brains out. And they take off. And the woman in the black dress takes off, too. I don't know who she is. So ends the life of Richard Kane. Richard Kane was very close to Mafia boss Sam Giancana. The two were, the two were like that. Roof of the County Records Building. Who do we have here? Harry Weatherford. Interesting guy. Harry Weatherford was a deputy sheriff, and he was a real weapons expert. And I don't mean he was a gun nut and had a lot of magazines. I mean, this guy really knew what he was doing when it came with guns. A few weeks before the assassination, Harry Weatherford orders a special rifle with a scope and a silencer on the end of it. Very interesting. In 1975, the, uh, on top of that building, there was a, um, like a, uh, 
a cooler or some kind of air conditioner that was on the fritz, and a guy goes up there to fix it, he finds a 30 odd shell casing underneath the, underneath the metal flashing there on that roof. Harry Weatherford was once asked, did you shoot President Kennedy? His response, listen to me, you little SOB. I shoot lots of people. That's a hell of a statement. Roger Craig. Now, Roger Craig has always been seen as a good guy by Kennedy researchers. So this one throws me for a loop a little bit. I'm not sure what I think about this. Um, Roger Craig was a deputy sheriff as well. Him and Harry Weatherford hated each other's guts. They did not get along, and openly so. Um, Roger Craig was a, a Officer of the Year in 1960. And um, he was, uh, their official job was to be on that roof that day. He was the first guy to identify the rifle in the book building that was found, not a Carcano, but that as of, a, of a Mauser. If you go back and listen to the first, you can see what's evidence of revision. Richard, you were talking about that earlier today. They announced that that first gun they found in the Dell Tex building was a Mauser, not a Carcano. That changed. Well, a Mauser is a real weapon. A Carcano is a piece of garbage. It was such a piece of junk that the Italian army, when it was in use, nicknamed it the humane weapon. Because past 50 yards, it's so inaccurate, you can't hit anything with it. A Mauser, you use a Mauser, you're going to get results. And he identifies that. Roger Craig also had said various things that were against the official story. In the 1970s, he's sitting in his father's house. By the way, I believe he had two previous attempted assassinations on his life. Someone shot him in the shoulder, and someone tried to run him off the road at one time. And he decides he's going to take a 22 rifle, put it against his chest, and kill himself. I find that tough to believe, but that's how officially he died. So I don't know what to think about this. Was Roger Craig a good guy? Was he a good guy steered bad? Or is Wallace so liquored up now that he's making mistakes or he's purposely handing out disinformation? We have to keep that in mind as well. That's possible. Jean Sautre, interesting character. An ex-OAS guy, OAS was like an anti-Charles de Gaulle outfit. They did some terrorism activity. A uh, bunch of paratroopers and, a, and a military guys who had fought in Algiers were a little pissed off at de Gaulle when he wanted to give Algiers back to the Algerians. You know, how dare he do something like that. He didn't like Morgan David Wine. He didn't like Morgan David Wine? I don't blame him. I don't like that garbage either. Okay. Uh, he had stayed at the Holland Avenue safe, safe house for a short time. Uh, he was also part of the French connection, the heroin stuff, traveling through Marseille. And uh, the head of the, uh, the outfit at that time was a guy named Antoine Gavigny. And um, French chemists at the time were, were, the, were the best to cook up dope. And it would come out of Turkey and places. They'd go to uh, Marseille, and then it'd go down to Canada and be distributed by Italian and Jewish mobsters all over the United States. So that's how that worked. He also went by the name Michael Victor Mertz. So we're going to come back to the name Michael Victor Mertz. Richard Scalzetti. Well, this is Richard Kane's name. So Wallace here is liquored up. He doesn't know what he's talking about. It's possible he wants to talk about Charles Chucky Nicoletti, who we're going to mention. And he gets it confused. So I don't know what to think about this. But this is the, this is the end of, uh, of uh, his. Is a, um, his little list of people. We're going to go over a few more, and then we're going to call it a day. Here's another picture of Malcolm Wallace right here. Anybody recognize this character standing next to him? George. That's George Bush Sr. This is a Skull and Bones meeting, and Skull and Bones is a semi-secret society on the Yale campus. This is why I talked about Yale before. And so it looks to me like Wallace went to Yale. Yes? No, I don't think Kerry is. I think Kerry might have been a little later. Okay. Um, but this right here is William F. Buckley, CIA prick, and head of the um, phony uh, conservative movement in America with his uh, paper, was it National Review? <coughs> so you know that George Bush Sr. for decades couldn't remember where he was or what he was doing when Kennedy was killed, just had no recollection of the day. Then all of a sudden, years later, he remembers. He remembers making a phone call. Remembers, oh, yeah, I, well, I don't believe a word out of his mouth because I'm 100% convinced that's George Bush Sr. right there standing in front of the uh, Texas School Book Building. And put this one in your pocket. He, too, was arrested coming out of the Dal Tex Building. 
Now, he was picked up by the sheriff's department, him and a couple guys. He was questioned. And they let him go, saying, we have a Texas oil man in custody. Yes. That's noticed that this cop is the same cop that was leading Chauncey and them around. This is the same cop that was leading Chauncey around? The other one. This yeah, guy? Yeah. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Looks to me, like to me it looks like? Yeah. To you? Okay. It looks like it to me. The Dow Tex building had a CIA front company inside of it. George Bush Sr. is thought of by many to put that hit team into the Dow Tex building. Interesting. By the way, if you want to know what George Bush Jr. was doing that day, he's wandering around in Daly Plaza too. He's all 17 years old in this picture. He's got the same retarded look on his face as he does years later in the White House. Some things never change. What's going on here? Here's another picture of the three tramps. Yeah, is that, you think it's that cop? Okay. So here's these here's these cops right here marching the three tramps off to uh, the three tramps off to uh, being questioned, and um, they don't look too serious about it. Here, the president's just been shot, governor's just been shot, a police officer's just been shot, and these cops are wandering around like kids who found their dad's shotguns, going squirrel hunting or something. You know, they don't look like they're. Hmm? This is the same ramp. Uh, they were coming up when you were shot by that. Oh, that was the same, same ramp right there? Yeah, right there. Okay. Right there. Interesting. Yeah. And now look at this. None of these guys are in cuffs or detained in any way. And now we have a total stranger walking right through the lineup. I mean, this violates how many, you know, police procedures here. Or is he a total stranger? Because he's been identified by two military people as Major General Edward Lansdale. Edward Lansdale was involved in numerous assassinations and government overthrows throughout the world. At the end of World War II, Lansdale was involved in the capture and torture of a Japanese general. Well, they didn't torture the general, they tortured his aide, who I think was a major or a colonel. A yeah, and a driver. Into finding out where all the Japanese where the Japanese had hidden all the stolen gold that they had ripped off before and during the war, hidden it in the Philippines. And apparently much of this gold was recovered. It was shipped to over 100 banks all over the world and has been used to fund black operations for decades. Uh, you're not going to find this in your high school history book on World War II, if they even teach World War II in high school. Who knows? Yes, that's true. So Lansdale is quite a piece of work. E. Howard Hunt. E. Howard Hunt was a career CIA guy involved in every kind of set of creepy CIA stuff you could possibly imagine. And um, I believe this is him uh, here on the street. A lot of people say that E. Howard Hunt was that third tramp. I disagree. I'm not going to sit and get in an argument with people who disagree, but that's up to you. I don't know if it makes the story any better or any worse, because E. Howard Hunt was there. He left a deathbed confession with his son, St. John Hunt. And, um, and he said, yes, there was, a, um, there was a plot to kill the president. Yes, he was there. Yes, Lyndon Johnson was involved. He was a bench warmer. That's what he calls it, some kind of spook language. Not 100% sure what I know what it means, but he's involved in the operation. And that um, the name of this was called the big event. Now, his son, St. John, went public with this thing immediately, probably saving his life. Guess how many mainstream news organizations picked it up? One. Yeah, Rolling Stone magazine, if you want to call them mainstream. You know, nobody else touched it. No New York Times, no Washington Post, no Baltimore Sun, blah, 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 blah. All the alphabet television stations and all you little liberals out there that love your NPR, they didn't touch it either because they're bought and paid for it too. Yes? E. Howard Hunt's wife, from what I read, was also in the CIA. Yes, and she was killed in a plane crash. By E. Howard. Yeah, yeah. So E. Howard Hunt was quite a piece of work. He was, also known, he was also known for wearing this particular brand of raincoat and these kind of hats. So I am 100% convinced that's him. It's up for you know, debate. Sure looks like him to me, too. Charles Chucky Nicoletti, one of the gangsters out of Chicago, thought to be involved in the Dal Tex building, possibly a shooter or a spotter. Uh, Chucky Nicoletti was a career gangster and a career hitman. He was involved in at least two dozen murders. And anybody here ever see the, the, the movie Casino? Ever see that movie? Remember when Joe Pesci puts the guy's head in a vice? And he's cranking it and he's screaming at the guy, Charlie M., you made me pop your F and I out of your head to Well, that really happened. 
but it was a little bit different. In the movie, it takes place in Las Vegas. In real life, gangster Anthony Spilatro takes Billy McCarthy's head, puts it in a vice in Chicago, and cranks it and pops his eye out. Word around the campfire is Chucky Nicoletti sitting there watching this whole thing go down, and he's eating a plate of spaghetti or some kind of pasta dish. So he's a real interesting guy. Now, Nicoletti was in Dallas. People who, who knew Nicoletti saw him there. And um, the government knew he was there. Uh, he, Nicoletti was called to testify before the House Select Committee on Assassinations. But before he could go, he's sitting in his car one night in the parking lot of the Golden Horn Restaurant in his home state of Illinois in an area called North Lake. And somebody walks up and puts three bullets into him. When the ambulance shows up to pick Nicoletti up, take him to the hospital where he's dead, um, someone forgot to turn the engine off in his car, and his car lights on fire. Oops. Now, it's funny, I'm not a car guy, but I have some friends who are really into cars, and I asked them, uh, we were sitting around one day having beers, I said, is there a car that you know of where if you leave the engine running, it lights on fire? They couldn't think of one. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking this is a message or something that they're leaving. Not entirely sure what's going on here. Who are these guys? This guy's got his hand up. This guy's got an umbrella out. It's not raining. Right during the assassination. And then after the shots go off, everyone's running around like chickens with their heads cut off. And they just sit down on the curb, hanging out together. You know? Huh. This guy looks like he has something under his jacket or his shirt here. A lot of people suspect it's a radio. But who are they? Now, I'm not 100% sure that these two guys are, but I'm 95% sure. First guy, Orlando Bosch. Orlando Bosch is another anti-Castro Cuban involved in Operation 40. Uh, the man didn't know a stick of dynamite that he didn't like. He was involved in terrorist activities all over the world, in countries that just traded with Cuba, from Spain into Japan, and over 78 terrorist bombings and things. He was even involved in the famous Cubana flight, uh, I think it's 544, which was bombed, killed over 70 people including some Cuban um, athletes that were going to compete in the Olympics. He's pardoned by George Bush Sr. in 1990. That's pretty nice of him. He passed away, I think, uh, he passed away in Miami, Florida, 2006 or something like that. Don't quote me on the, on the, uh, the date there. But he, he lived a nice, long, happy life after murdering dozens and dozens of people. I hate to even bring this guy up because he's so controversial. I don't know where the lies begin and the chicanery ends with this character, Gordon Novell. Um, he, was a, uh, he was from Louisiana. He was involved in a neo-Nazi group when he was a kid, um, possibly involved in the firebombing of a movie theater that actually allowed black people to watch the same movies as white people. You know, you had Jim Crow laws back then. So this movie theater decided, nah, screw that. We're not going to do that. Everyone can come watch our movies. And it blows up. And he's possibly involved in that firebombing. He was definitely involved in a, uh, um, a heist of an armory. And the weapons and equipment and stuff from that armory were shipped to the Bay of Pigs. Very interesting, which is a CIA operation. And he claims he was never, ever involved with CIA. I don't know if it was, I, I don't think it was one up here. I think it was one down south. But there were several armory break-ins and thefts. Okay, and, and Werbel was involved in a couple of those, right? Okay. So, <clears throat> but he claims he was never involved in CIA, had nothing to do with them. Interesting, although he knows James Jesus Angleton personally. So you figure that one out. He was a self-proclaimed electronics expert. And um, he even became a uh, private investigator for the DeLorean Car Company for a while, which I find interesting, because he spent the last years of his life trying to raise $60,000 to make a movie about time travel and UFOs, right? But the DeLorean Car was used in the movie Back to the Future to time travel. I thought that was very fascinating. Lucien Sarti. Long suspected to be a gunman, he was outed in a, uh, a, a series of videos called The Men Who Killed Kennedy, which were produced in the 1990s by a, uh, a television outfit in England. And um, an investigative journalist, Steve Ravel, uh, through his sources, had, a, uh, had a, an informant named Michelle Nicoli, who the American government says is 100% credible, and he names Lucian as one of the shooters. And um, he named two other people, but... He didn't want, they weren't going to be, he refused to name two other people, but said the two other people involved. Now, Sarti is often um, 
confused with Sotre because they used each other's names. And they both went by the name Michael Victor Mers. So this causes a lot of confusion. And it works so well, we're still confused to this day. So was Sotre and Sarti both there? Was just one of them there? So it's very interesting. Sarti was killed in the early 1970s in Mexico in a drug deal gone bad. The police come in, there's a big shootout, and he lost. <laughs> He's dead. It looks yes. like one of the Bowens people that came to one of my safe houses mm -hmm. on the road. Okay. Way before all Way before? Because he was a Corsican guy yeah. out of Marseille, and he... I'd say he looks like my own okay. Bowen. According to uh, Michelle Nicoli, they came in on Italian passports up through Mexico. He was with us three weeks, that guy. About three weeks yeah. he was with you guys? If it was him, yeah. If it was him, okay. It didn't speak English, was it? Damn. All right. Yeah. A couple left, and then we're going to end it here. Jack Lawrence, one of the weirdest stories I've ever heard of. Jack Lawrence was a, um, it was a car salesman at a Lincoln, Olds, I mean, a, a Lincoln Mercury place there in Dallas. Claims he'd given Lee Harvey Oswald a test drive in his car which is weird because we're told Oswald couldn't drive a car. So is this an Oswald double, or did, could Lee Harvey Oswald actually drive and acted like he couldn't drive? I don't really know. The day before the assassination, Lawrence borrows a car from the dealership. I, I don't know if he could do that or not. I guess he could. And um, the day of the assassination, he's supposed to work, but he shows up really late. He's covered from mud from his knees down. He's white as a ghost, he's shaky, walks right past his co-workers onto the floor, goes into the bathroom and starts puking his guts out. He doesn't come back with the car either. The car is found the next day behind the picket fence, covered in mud. Now there's some people, now Jack Lawrence was questioned by the police. Turns out Jack Lawrence was a crack shot in the United States Air Force. Some people think that he had alphabet agency connections. I can't prove any of that, I don't know. Don't know really what happened to him after that. Very strange guy. Some people suspect he was in the sewer. Some people suspect he was underneath the bridge in a little alcove. I don't know where he was. Very interesting. Tony Nestor Escadro. He's associated with the Daltex building too by some researchers. An anti-Castro Cuban, an extremely devout Catholic. He went to Catholic schools his whole life. And he was a real tough customer. He was, um, he was involved in the Bay of Pigs invasion. Um, Another Operation 40 guy as well. He's killed in a plane crash in 1978. Um, I tend to doubt that Escadra was involved. I, I put him here because there's a lot of Kennedy researchers that I really respect that put him in that Daltex building. I got problems because the last time I checked, he's black. Why would you want to put a black hitman on that high profile in the South? It just doesn't make any sense to me. I'm not saying he wasn't involved. I just suspect, uh, I'm suspicious of it. I find it to be weird. Um, there's a statue built for him in Little Havana in, in uh, Florida. And when you ask the locals, why is that guy there and who was he? They'll say, well, that's Tony Nestor Escadro. He took care of business. Well, he took care of business where? It didn't say he took care of business in Dallas or the Bay of Pigs. So again, I find it. I mention him out of respect for other researchers. This is the last, uh, last guy we're going to talk about, and then we're going to wrap it up. Roscoe White. Roscoe White was a police officer in Dallas, Texas. He had only been a police officer for a few weeks before the assassination. He was an ex-Marine, and he was in the United States Marine Corps same time as Lee Harvey Oswald. He was also stationed in Atsugi, Japan, in a secret base, same time as Lee Harvey Oswald. He's in Subic Bay uh, in the Philippines, same time as Lee Harvey Oswald. He's in a, a off the coast of Indonesia and a CIA invasion force, same time as Lee Harvey Oswald. And he's in Dallas, Texas, same time as Lee Harvey Oswald. Now, nobody ever comes out and says they knew each other. You think they might have bumped into each other at a water cooler here and there? I think so. Just my speculation. Now, Roscoe White's wife overheard him and Jack Ruby talking about killing the president days before the assassination. This is a, a famous picture called Badge Man blown up from this shot right here. And it shows a guy in a police uniform firing a rifle right at the camera. I can see it pretty clear. This is also a possibility a guy in a military uniform here and a guy with a hard hat right here. That one I can't make out. Long suspected Roscoe White was a shooter uh, in the Kennedy assassination. 
Roscoe White also had a diary that was uh, um, confiscated by the FBI, according to his wife. Now, he dies in, in the early 1970s in an industrial accident. Somebody had left a welding torch too close to a gas tank, and boom. Roscoe White and his co-worker are both hit by the explosion. His co-worker lives. Roscoe dies a day later. Now, apparently, Roscoe was a fairly religious man, and a minister came to visit him in the hospital where Roscoe admitted to taking human life abroad and in the United States. Now, people say, well, he confessed to killing uh, Tippett. He confessed to shooting the president. No, he didn't. That's a myth. But he did admit to killing people. Here's a, a, a hymn book, supposedly, with Roscoe White's uh, um, things that he writes down. He says, I had to kill my fellow officer, J.D. Tippett, but his wife and children will be taken care of. Signed, W.A. Roscoe White. Now, is this real? I don't know. It's interesting. Here's a, here's a Navy intelligence memorandum. Uh, this next assignment is to eliminate a national security threat to worldwide peace. Houston, Austin, or Dallas. And a lot of people think this is a, because Roscoe White was definitely connected to the CIA. There's no doubt about it. Um, that he was a CIA operative and that he had shot the president. We've all seen this picture, right? Lee Harvey Oswald holding up communist newspaper. He's got that rifle in his hand. Well, this has been heavily doctored. We'll just go through a couple of quick things why it doesn't make any sense. You try standing at this angle, see how long you stand up before you fall over, right? Shadows on the face do not in any way match the shadows on the ground. Somebody got sloppy with the X-Acto knife and cut his fingertips right off. See that? This ain't even the same rifle that was found in the book building because it has a different length barrel and the lug nut's in a different place. That's not even the same gun. Now, people don't realize that there are more than one of these cool backyard pictures taken. Here's the one that was used in the Time magazine. Here's this one here. Look at this hand right here. That doesn't even look like a human hand. It looks like a mutated potato. So somebody got messy with the airbrush and the uh, X-Acto knife there. The backgrounds are all identical, which is impossible with a handheld camera. The faces are all the same, which is technically impossible. And again, the shadows don't match. Where were these pictures found? Amongst Roscoe White's personal possessions. We're going to go back just one real quick here. It's interesting because Lee Harvey Oswald had a pointy chin. Roscoe White had a big, huge football player looking chin. Look at the chin on Oswald. It's not pointy. He's too short to be Lee Harvey Oswald, but he's the same size as Roscoe White. He's got this weird bump on his arm. Lee Harvey Oswald didn't have a bump on his arm like that, but Roscoe White did. Interesting. So who killed Kennedy? That's the, uh, that's the $65 question, right? These guys did it. I mean, as far as the, I know we talked about boots on the ground and hit teams and stuff like that. In the end, they're basically just window dressing because every single one of these guys is connected to one or more of these operations right here. And people say, well, you left out the big bankers. Well, the oligarch families are the ones that run the banks. They're members of secret societies, which create the alphabet agencies, which are funded by tycoons and things. State of Israel is involved in the military industrial complex. That's who killed Kennedy. So I want to thank everyone for coming out. I really appreciate it. And uh, be good out there and stay out of sword fights. And I'm going to leave you with one more thing. Don't believe anything I say. Try to prove me wrong. If I made a mistake on a name or a date or something, I'll cop to it. But if just one-tenth of what I say is true, it ought to scare the hell out of you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to take questions. Well, Tom Harvin said that uh, it was the mafia that killed him. Well, they were involved. This week. Okay. <laughs> Who did? Tom Harvin. Who is that? Who is he? That's a liberal talk guy that's oh. on the morning every weekday. Oh, morning. so obviously I'm going to be listening to him. Yeah. <laughs> I might listen to him. But they wrote a book about the Kennedy assassination. Yeah, well, Tom Lamar Harvin and this other guy. There's been a couple of those. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> Two or three of those books on that candidate has asked me. Well, he's a left gatekeeper, is what he is. Ah. Oh, yeah. Any what other? Yes, Richard, continue. Are you done? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, how about the recent release of all the Kennedy stuff and then they pull it back? 
Trump well, yeah. They, what they happened? Just, well, they were supposed to release all these documents and stuff, right? right. And then they Some released the just a, a pittance. I think it was less than 1%. Well, no, it's not like more than that, but the, what, Chris Trump is going to release it all, and then the CIA and the FBI oh, come yeah. out and say, no, no, no. Yeah, because there's names in there that people still want. Well, wait a second. If Oswald did it, Right? And if it's the way you say, why? what's the problem? And of course, absolutely, it's just completely out. So did Trump get in trouble from the CIA? They went, no, no, we can't do this at Well, all. again, they, they probably showed him the, the Beverly Oliver footage. You know, any <laughs> questions? No, she was yeah. real high past. Hmm, who? Beverly Oliver. She has climbed down. Right? Yeah, she doesn't want to talk about a lot of stuff. Yeah. Um, because she was, uh, she had a mob, old mob boyfriend or yeah, something. I know. Beat the living hell out of her. So, but she's still alive. Any other? And she got religion. Yeah. Any other? Yes? So, of the 1% or whatever, mm -hmm. was, there, was there any interesting information that was released? No, but Judith Barry Baker has gone through, so she was Lee Harvey Oswald's girlfriend for a short time in uh, Louisiana, and she had posted a few things saying, hey, I talked about this, you know, 20 years ago, and nobody believed me, now here's the proof, those kind of things. But there's no smoking gun type of stuff. The government's never going to say, okay, well, you know, we did it, anything like that. You're never going to see that. Mm -hmm. And all the stuff that's supposed to be released after that, it probably never will be released. Or if it does, it's going to be redacted. And, you know, it's going to look like a, some kid took a magic marker and just, here you go. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you know, uh, okay. Michael first, and then, then you, okay. All right. The thing that I'm hearing from those release documents, or at least the idea that they're trying to put across, is that um, there was a major issue in the United States at that time with uh, the threat of the Soviet Union. So anything that the CIA was doing at that time with mm -hmm. Cuba, with uh, potentially, you know, the mob or whatever, uh, was only there to be combating communism. That, that's the main thrust of these that's how well, they that's coerced, what they say. That's how so. they coerced um, uh, Warren into getting on the bandwagon. That was the main person that got coerced into You're right. Kyle Hoover and that bunch. And uh, they had a lot of people in on it. How it can buffalo on it. But I think the release is is just to keep the hit off the heat off the real <clears throat> you know How much work they did to keep to hide the things that can really be released from everybody else now. Yep. Oh, yeah. They've been getting, getting rid of that stuff right and left. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to go on record, although um, I know it's going to sound like a conspiracy, but I know I'm supposed to be a Manchurian candidate. Uh -huh. And I know that I was supposed to be like a Tim Timothy McVeigh or a presidential shooter. But the reason why nobody has gathered to do a big conspiracy on me is because I'm not obedient. Oh, and yeah. I've been really, really hammered and beat in a lot, but I'm not obedient. And it's been uh, uh, 50 years of this stuff. And I was probably implanted, and I was implanted uh, from the age of two with microwiring and then also to, on through stages, they check you out to make sure that you're implanted well. Mm -hmm. With a, a co cochlear implant and also to a transponder and stuff like that, mm -hmm. and a, and a <coughs> microprocessor, and 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 various um, implants throughout your body. But anyway, the idea is I just want to let you know I know that McCultra is real and I know that mind control is real, and I know that these organizations are real, but mine have not assembled because I'm not being obedient. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for sharing that. Yeah. If you want, Did you have a question? Uh, are there any uh, immediate family members of Dorothy Kilgallen or any nieces of nephews still alive? Do you know? Oh, I don't know because I haven't. There's, there's, there's recently been a book published about her, Dorothy oh, Kilgallen. Really? Yeah. I can't remember the writer, but he's been. About uh, five or six months ago, he was making the radio circuits, you know, talking about mm -hmm. his book, and he pretty did an in depth thing. Um, that book would probably tell you. I don't know that much about her, but I do know that when she was killed, none of those recordings that she took a ruby were ever found, or whatever she wrote down, and her, 
Her estranged husband at the time made some kind of cryptic comment that these things never would be found. Do you know if those interviews occurred in the county jail down there? In what? In the, in the Dallas County Jail. Is that where the interviews took place? I think it took place in the jail, yeah. Okay. I think she was the only news reporter that interviewed him. Right. There should have been a line around the block. Was an angle to right in a place right after the murder? Oh, that I don't know. But they proved that, I'm pretty sure, that he actually went to her apartment. Oh, really? Interesting. Himself. Yeah, yeah, no. By the way, my name is John Hills. I just wanted to make sure that they were you. But yeah, I'm a victim of mind control and work culture and all that. Interesting. Were you ever in the military? Yeah. Um, I was only for about three months, uh, but I didn't make it in basic training. Okay. Because I wouldn't, um, well, I didn't, I, I really thought the National Guard was going to be more like helping people and stuff like that. When I found out it was, we were really going to go into war at, uh, at the time uh, I ran, mm -hmm. I, uh, I messed it up. Mm. Because I, I, do, I don't believe in killing other human beings. Uh huh. Okay. Anybody else have anything? No. Brian, thank you very much for your presentation, and you're very well versed in the subject. Oh, thank which you. Which certainly is curious. Um, I'm wondering, you presented a scenario where there's obviously five or six different and I'll just call them shooting teams, shooters and observers and whatnot. But um, do you think that there's any one individual or a pair of individuals who knew all of oh, what the was whole going deal? on? Or is it possible that maybe three of the teams knew what they were doing, but they weren't aware of the other, of some team of the other two teams, or team three over you know, here compartmentalization. Uh, I'm sure there was plenty of compartmentalization because that's what you want to do. If any of these sure guys, there were people that knew people that were in on it, yeah. crossing information, and Johnson knew an awful lot about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Wallace, yeah. Yeah, I think, was an orchestrator in the very fact that um, that E. Howard Hunt was there, and that uh, uh, that that uh, general was there. Um, what was his name? Lansdale. Yeah, Lansdale. Yeah. I'd tell you that they were probably the ones up higher on the food chain running that operation, yeah. because to me that looks like a military operation. I thought, yeah. You know, <clears throat> so you hire your guys. You have it all. You got communications people. You got spotters. You have signalers. We saw, but I believe those guys were signalers, and the whole thing, <laughs> yeah. like clockwork, and of course. They had all these other ZR rifle guys and yeah. probably there. In case Kennedy got out of there for some reason, they'd kill him further on down the road. I bet you there were other hit people that we never even heard of. Too many symptoms, so. Yeah. So I had a couple questions. Yeah. The first thing, why do you think you're still alive? And then <laughs> the other thing, uh, why, if they're going to knock, knock somebody off, it's a crime scene, why would all of these uh, uh, intellectual authors of the crime all be there. That seems kind of, that you would think that they would want to be as far away from there as possible. No What's your idea knowledge. about that? No foreknowledge. I don't think anybody had any real foreknowledge. They, Not thought, of, would. they thought of their own thing and no. They thought of what? Well, we may have known a few people were in on it with them, but they never knew the, the old conglomeration. You know. How many it, people it, that you know, Rod, are now dead? I knew a hell of a lot of them. That, uh, I didn't know any of them were going to do what they did that day. And now, how many did that? Are oh, dead? Yeah, over 60, over 70 people that shouldn't have been there that I knew. I should have uh, been all that down. I don't know. I'm leaving it to Mr. So why do you think you're still alive today, Gigi? Because I went to Africa. Oh. Yeah. Because I got out, of, got out of Dallas and went, went to Africa, stayed there for about eight, ten years. That was why they, they wouldn't wipe it out that far. If they wanted to, they would have. I was too small. Yeah. 
Did you hear any rumors of anybody trying to find you? Not that I know of. I changed my name a couple of times. Rick Seaforth, and I had passports and everything else for that. Mm. So, um, I was the keeper of the ID at that time. It was a much simpler thing than the computer stuff today. I couldn't touch that stuff. I have a, I have some might be one of, you said why were all these people there when they could have uh, I think a lot of it is arrogance uh, arrogance and bravado yeah. I mean you know Lyndon Johnson did some of the craziest stuff you could possibly imagine when he was president walking around naked inside the Air Force One he's whacking his wiener on a table in front of news reporters and stuff I mean this guy was nuts since he had no problem you know being out in front of people a lot of these guys are just arrogant psychopathic maniacs. They're not stupid or anything, but they're, yeah, let's get together and let's do this. That's the when, one explanation. Yeah. When Lyndon beat the horse or the donkey with the baseball bat in front of the restaurant, do you know what city in Texas that was? No, I, don't. I think it was an axe handle, but um, could have had a baseball bat. <coughs> yeah, and I don't know, but he did it right in front of a whole bunch of people. Oh, yeah. He tied a stick of dynamite to a dog's head one time when he was a kid, yeah. blew him up. You know, this is the type of people we're dealing with, and you know. Plus, you had the three, the the previous attempts to assassinate yes. Kennedy in Chicago and in Florida. Florida, Florida, possibly one in New York, that were aborted, and then yeah. maybe everybody thought, well, this is it, this is the big one. Mm -hmm. Better show up. Also, Lyndon Johnson's getting ready to go to prison too. I talked about this in my last yeah. one, and um, right. that weekend they're meeting to discuss charges that he's going to be brought up on. Uh, he was involved in corruption up to his eyeballs. And um, if he didn't become president, Lyndon Johnson was going to be going to the Gray Bar Hotel instead of the White House. He was going to go to jail. That would have been a lot nicer story. I would have loved to have seen Johnson in jail. But, um, I, frankly, I wish I had never written about the damn thing myself. Yeah, stuff I know you said that before. And you had another question? Well, I was just going to comment that uh, when you were talking about the arrogance of these people, you know, look at all the, look at uh, President Bush, you know, uh, you know, all these people, all these women oh, that he assaulted. Oh, yeah. You know, and, you know, uh, they, he had his hands on this stewardess's ass. They had proposed, postponed the takeoff on this, on this airplane, right? And it's coming out, you know, all of these people, you know, that have so much nerve, they, they don't think that they're ever going to get caught. No. And look at the ones that, it, a lot of them never get caught. Look at all the corruption Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton are involved in. They're not going to jail, right? Half of their, if their minions don't get slaughtered in some non-robbery on the street somewhere in a coffee shop, um, they don't get in trouble. Um, look at uh, all the... Uh, the nonsense Obama was involved in. You look at this Pizzagate scandal, I don't know if you've heard of that, it's going into the upper echelons of everything, all these people involved in all this child porn pedophilia stuff, nobody's going to jail for that. There's no investigation of it. And um, I mean, we had one of those scandals that was involved in the um, Reagan Bush White House too, that whole Boys Town thing. No one went to jail for that, except for Larry, uh, King. Larry King. One guy went to the joint, a low level guy. And he, he's out now. I think he's a car salesman. So. I never thought of getting caught on anything. All the things I pulled, I never mm -hmm. thought of. Uh, you were going to get caught? There is an arrogance there. Yeah. Just, yeah. At the low level I was at, I knew I was going to get away with what I was doing. Yeah, but you always got busted for whizzing on the street and stuff. Yeah, things, Little like, things that. like that. That was a local car. That's what you went to jail for. I didn't know anybody I knew. Yeah. Yeah, where'd you go streaky, Dad? <laughs> uh, streaking in, in Chicago. <laughs> Chicago Avenue. The guys locked the door to the bar and put me back in and they, they didn't know I was I got a Chicago way, I have no problems. Yes? Do you think that all the technology that's in use nowadays that it's harder to put together uh, something like uh, a presidential assassination and stuff? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, I'm not an expert on how to kill people or set people up for contract murder, but um, <laughs> I have an idea of how these things are done. I, I think it's a possibility. I think there's a possibility of both. I mean, you have explosives that are this small that can blow up a car. It'd be 
put places. But then again, you have detectors for all that kind of stuff. Yeah. The security teams are looking for everything. But then again, if you compromise the security team and they're in on it, you can do things that way. So yeah. I think the answer is yes and no. That's the thing. Yeah, I hope that that's not an answer, though. Yeah, I know. Sensors and stuff like that that you don't even know about. Or, yeah. st or private things, private yeah. cameras and all that. Well, you look at this know. drone stuff. They can just take a drone yeah. and just drop it anywhere on the planet. Well, t today they've made a snitch on everybody, so I don't know. Yeah. Every, Any time the police are asked to do their own job, it's just, will the public help us find this person, you know? What, let them get out there and do a little legwork and catch yeah. these people. They can do it. If they weren't sitting in a cruiser all yeah, day long it. watching the porn, uh, the they'd radio. be out on the street making connections, you know? So, yeah. So. When you got a cell phone, there's nothing better than a yeah, they are. every beat. Mm -hmm. Nothing better than a... Yeah, I, I, I just thought of that and I thought I'd ask that. Because I, you know, that's kind of pertinent to our day. Oh, yeah, it actually it is. And again, I, I think the best way to do it was one of these drones. I would have stayed you know, out pinpoint of the Pinpoint when it's all over your feet. And you get a big enough bomb, it doesn't matter what kind of car or something he's got. Yeah. So. Anything else? You guys, we're going to wrap it up? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the, uh,